Hey there weavers, welcome back. This is Grace with Tangled Webs Weaving. In my previous video, I demonstrated how to find the set of a yarn because I wanted to use this Eco Duo yarn by Cascade Yarns. So this is a 70% uh, baby alpaca and 30% merino yarn. And it's not a typical weaving yarn, it's a knitting yarn. So I figured out I wanted it at about five ends per inch and five picks per inch. So now I'm getting ready to weave my scarf. This is gonna be a plain weave woven on my rigid huddle loom. And the first thing that I need to do is take it from a skein into a ball so that I can then put it on the rigid huddle loom and also uh, put it on a shuttle. So we'll go ahead and do that. And this doesn't take very long. Just wind it onto a ball winder from a uh, umbrella swift. And I had to slow down because the first time it went flying off the ball winder. So um, you have to be kind of careful of that. This was a fairly soft yarn. So, um, and I'm not compressing it really tightly onto the uh, ball winder. So that's why I kind of slowed down. Um, as it builds up uh, weight on the ball winder, it will fly off. So just kind of be careful there. Okay, we've got it wound into a ball, or some people might call this a cake. And we'll make sure I can get the center pole end, and then we will move over to the rigid huddle loom. Now I've got this set up on my dining room table because it is the only place that I can use the direct peg warping method. I've got the heddle in, I found the middle of my Pedal, and then I'm going to count over uh, until I have five inches. So since this is a uh, five dent reed, I am going to count over um, 25 slots and holes. So the one slot end is a dent, one hole is a dent. So if it's five dents, then one inch is equal to five slots and holes combined. I hope that makes sense. So we'll figure out where we need to start and I will tie the yarn onto my back beam. Now this is backwards from, so I'm working from the back of the loom. So just go ahead and tie it on and then oh my reed hook is down at the other end. Of course it is. So we're to warp it, we're going to go through all the slots and because we're pulling two pieces of yarn through at once because it's a loop. And then we'll grab a loop and, and twist it, get some slack. Oh, and I have yarn barf. This is what happens when you have kind of a soft yarn to work with. Sometimes you get yarn barf. Um, so we'll have to kind of untangle it as we go. But we'll walk this loop down to the peg down at the other end of the table and loop that around the peg and then we will walk back to the back of the loom. I'm gonna grab this off the floor because I'm just gonna be struggling with the yarn barf. All right, so then on the next one, we're going to take the yarn over the top of the uh, bar, under it, and then through the next slot and walk that one down to the peg and wrap it around. We're gonna try and keep fairly even tension on each uh, loop, but it is kind of challenging. 
So you'll notice um, every time you go over the heddle bar or the warping bar back here at the back of the loom, you go the opposite way. So the first time we went over the bar, the second time we go under the bar, uh, the third time we'll go over the bar again. So this is a good way to get your steps in if you <laughs> count your steps, which I do. So just make sure that you're keeping um, your yarn distributed along your uh, yarn or along the warping bar. And see if we can, I got kind of got the tension messed up here. All right, there we go. And so that one we went under the bar and over the top. And we come back and you'll see that it is over the bar and then we have to come under it. So every other time you're going over uh, the, over the bar and every other time you're going under the bar. All right, I think we're done with the yarn bar. So uh, that can go on the floor where it's more convenient. And then we'll just keep going back and forth. So this, the length of the warp is 96 inches. And um, that will give me probably about 72 inches of finished uh, weaving. So I thought it might be a good idea to give you a view from the peg side. So you can see, just like if you're warping on a um, warping board, you don't want to stack the warp loops on top of the previous loop. You want it to be, um, they, you want them to be snugged up against each other, not um, on top of each other. And for those of you that are interested, uh, the shirt that I am wearing is available for purchase. It is uh, a shirt with my new logo on it. Um, I've got several different ones. I've got hoodies and uh, coffee cups. So they're kind of fun, um, help support my channel if you are interested and need a new shirt. So here we are back at the uh, business end and um, I've, I've wound all the warps so I'm just going to break that off and tie this to the heddle bar and then we can wind the warp onto the back beam. All right, so then come down to the peg end and um, pull off the peg, keeping your hand in the loop there. And then, wow, this is really static, full of static. All right, so we're just going to chain this up to keep it under control. I'll keep that loop over my wrist. There we go. And we'll just chain it up so that I can um, keep it under control. And that should be good. So we'll tilt you down here so you can see what I'm doing now here on the back beam. And I'm gonna take uh, my separator paper and put that 
over my warping cords there and just kind of wind that in. And hopefully I can get it in straight. This is always my problem. I can never get this stuff in straight. All right, so we've got it started. So we'll start cranking it on. All right, we'll get this last little bit um, straightened out of the paper. And then we can wind the rest on. If it overlaps a tiny bit, it's not going to be a problem. All right, so now I'm going to turn the loom around. And um, then we, we turn the loom around so that we can uh, thread from the front. So I'll go ahead and turn it and uh, put the clamps back in. All right, so uh, from the side here, you can see a little bit better. Um, I'm going to go ahead and cut my loops now. And then we will thread the heddles. So we've got all the slots threaded. And so we're going to take one thread from each slot, pull it out the back, and thread that with the threading hook through the hole. So you have a thread in the slot and a thread in the hole. And it doesn't really matter which uh, thread you take uh, and put through the hole. I tend to look at which one is on the left and I grab that one and I put that one through the hole. Um, all right, so here is from my vantage point and you can see that I grab the one on the left and pull it out of the slot and thread it through the hole. And you can see the variegation in this yarn. Um, some of it is more white than uh, the brown, and then some is more brown than white. So it's very cool. Um, we should get a lot of variation in the pattern when this is woven up, even though it is in a plain weave. All right, last one. Uh, now I'm going to go ahead and tie on to the front apron rod and I'm tying on in bundles of six just because that seems a little convenient. Um, I've got three on the left and three on the right and I can just pull those around. I know that that won't give me an even number when I go to uh, tie the last bundle on in the middle, but that's okay. And then it's a good idea to alternate back and forth so that you get an even tension across your warp. So we'll tie one uh, half of the square knot and then when we get them all tied on then we'll come back and we will tie the second part of the square knot making sure that all the bouts are ab about the same um, tension. And I'm not tightening these really tight as far as like pulling tension on the warp. Um, I'm trying to make them all the same. All right, so now we will just uh, wind it forward so that we can um, start weaving. All right, so I thought it might be helpful to also show you how I wind a stick shuttle. So I make a slip knot in one end and I slip that over the slip, uh, shuttle and then I alternate going under each leg of the stick shuttle going back and forth. Seriously, more yarn barf. Ugh. <laughs> okay, so 
So then when I'm ready to switch sides, I go under the leg and then rotate the shuttle to the other side. Go under the leg, rotate, and then I go. So I'm always going under the legs. So I'll wind this shuttle until I have, I use up all of this skein of yarn. I think I can get it all on here. I'm pretty sure I can. All right, there we go. Now we're ready to weave. So I'm going to put in a uh, header first. And I just have some scrap uh, wool yarn here on this shuttle that I'm going to use. So I'm going to put in um, one, and this is doubled because it's fairly thin. So I'm going to put in the first pick, and I'm not going to beat that in. I'm just going to place it straight across. I'm going to change my shed, put in my second pick. This pick will be angled um, at approximately a 45. Again, do not beat. Change your shed and then put in a third pick. This will uh, spread your warp for the most part as uh, and get it kind of equaled out. So push that down now and push it down to the bottom. And it didn't uh, do it as well as some. This is kind of a slippery yarn with the alpaca in there. Uh, but I will go ahead and put in a good header on this because uh, the waste yarn that is at the beginning and the end of my project will be the fringe for my scarf. So I'm going to just go ahead and weave this, uh, the rest of this scrap yarn in as my header. It'll give me a good base. Uh, for spreading the warp and also it will protect my warp so that I can put in the uh, fringe. So now I'm going to advance the warp and I can start weaving with the uh, Eco Duo Alpaca Merino blend. So I want to leave enough of a tail on my weft, uh, about four times the width of my project, so that I can hem stitch this. And I like doing that when, well, let's make it three times. Um, I like to hem stitch the scarves because it gives a nice base for the twisted fringe to um, go up against and it holds everything in place. So we'll put in a few picks of the yarn and again this stuff is so staticky it's just sticking to everything. And of course you pass it through the shed and it rubs on itself and then that makes more static. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and do my hem stitching now. I have a blunt uh, tapestry needle that I will thread the, that big long tail onto. And then we'll go ahead and hem stitch. So um, I'm going to hem stitch in bundles of two. And I got a little short here at the end because my yarn kind of came apart on me, but um, I've got enough there. 
and I've actually got enough to include into my fringe, which is perfect. So we'll continue weaving on and uh, you'll see the pattern or the randomness of the pattern uh, start to come out. I think it's not going to be so much that you'll see patterns as you'll see pooling of uh, colors because while this particular part of the skein has um, striping in it, a lot of the skein has either the darker brown or um, a white. And it's just striped where those two kind of commingle. And uh, you'll get lighter tans and darker, darker tans. Um, so we'll probably see pooling of color in throughout the scarf. So it'll be kind of cool to see what it ends up being. So I decided to do a time lapse, uh, which I've done before. It is, it's a little more uh, compre compressed than just speeding up the video. And this will actually give you a kind of a picture of how that color pools on the warp as it forms. So you can see I've got some areas in the in the warp where it is lighter and then as I weave the weft in you can see the interaction of those colors. So here we're coming up to the end of the warp and I'm kind of pushing my luck here because some of the warp threads are getting um, rather stretched and frayed from the tension, I think. Um, so we'll go ahead and hem stitch uh, the end here. And yep, I was right. These are absolutely fraying. Um, so with them being singles, they are just kind of pulling apart um, with the, the high tension that I put on it. So that was my mistake. I probably should not have pushed so far, but um, so we'll cut it off the loom and I had one broken thread there that I had to uh, weave in. And now I'm going to do a, the twisted fringe and I've got a fringe twister. I'm combining two warp threads together. I will twist them um, for about 20 twists with the fringe twister. And then I will take two of those sets of two and I will let those twist back on themselves and create a fringe from those. So I take it out of there and I tie a knot in it, move it down to about where I want it to be, and then let go and voila, you have a fringe. So the nice part about uh, having the four fringe twister gadget is uh, you can do two fringes at a time and it cuts the work in half. Well, maybe not half, by a third. All right, so we'll just go ahead and uh, finish twisting the rest of these. And the fuzz is just kind of going crazy on this. Let's see, get this a little closer so I can go over the edge of my table. Yeah, sorry, you can't really see the clamps on the fringe twister very well when I'm doing this. So they all need to be fairly equal and then put tension on them, twist them in the same direction as the uh, yarn is plied already. This isn't plied, but it is spun into a single. So we're going to go the same way that the single already is. And they want, the hairs want to 
grab onto each other, so I have to separate them. And then take them off, tie an overhand knot, and I'm not tying these overhand knots super tight because I may end up moving them depending on um, how long the each of the fringes are. All right, so I'll just finish up the rest of these and then we can wet finish the scarf. Okay, I've got some uh, warm water here with some uh, wool wash in it. And we're going to go ahead and push this into the water gently. We don't want to uh, agitate it and possibly felt it. It does have a high content of alpaca, which doesn't felt as easily as wool, but we don't want to take any chances. Um, I do want to felt a little bit because it is a little bit sleazy. Um, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. I'm going to let this soak for about 15 or 20 minutes and then we will come back and rinse it out. Okay, we've let the, uh, wool, the scarf soak for about 15 or 20 minutes and it didn't really bloom as much as I had hoped. So I'm gonna agitate it quite a bit um, and then We'll wring it out, uh, well not wring it, we'll squeeze it out, squeeze out the, the soapy water. It always amazes me how dirty the water is from wool that is clean, supposedly from the store. Uh, but we'll rinse out the uh, container and then fill it up with clean warm water again and then we will um, rinse the scarf. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and push it back in. I'll kind of squish it around some more, make sure I get all the soap out. Um, it's not felting at all. Uh, I could probably put it in hot water and uh, agitate it and it wouldn't felt. Um, so I don't really have any concerns about that. But it is nice and soft though. Um, I'm going to squeeze out the water. I'm not going to wring it um, because like I said, it is fairly sleazy material and I'm hoping once it dries, it'll kind of uh, bond together a little bit maybe, um, but we'll, we'll see. Um, but we'll squeeze out as much water as we can. And then I am going to uh, lay this in a towel that I have over here and um, that will get out the excess water from uh, washing it. I'll, I'll, I'll lay it out flat and then we can roll it up in the towel and squeeze out any excess water. But you can see the color pooling that we got, uh, which is super cool. So there's lighter areas and darker areas. Um, and I think it looks really awesome. I'm really happy with how it's turned out. So we'll flip, this is a big towel that I have. It's a bath sheet and it's an old one that I use for my weaving and my dyeing. And so we'll just roll it up in there, um, squish it really hard make sure that we can get out as much water as possible. And then um, we can unroll it again. And just to see how it works, I'm going to go ahead and thwack it. So this is a, a process that you can use to full your wool and um, so basically it's damp and you just whack it on the countertop. Um, some people whack it against a, uh, the edge of the counter and it helps full the wool. I don't really think it's gonna do a whole lot for this scarf, but it can't hurt, right? <laughs> 
and it's so satisfying to thwack it against the countertop. Um, but we'll see, we'll see what happens. It is really nice and soft. I think it's going to be a great, uh, great scarf. It's nice and soft and, but light and airy. So we'll go ahead and take this and, um, put it on the drying rack and, um, let it dry. And then we will come back and show you the final product. So here we are with our Eco Duo scarf and it's all washed and dried now and it turned out really nice. You can see the different um, variations and the coloring and we'll open up a little more here. Um, and in person, it almost has a shiny uh, texture or look to it. So it, it looks very rich. It's nice and soft and light and airy. You can see, I don't know if you can see through the light. Um, you, can, you can see through it. It's very open weave structure. Uh, this is a plain weave but the weave structure was set at five ends per inch, five picks per inch. So it was pretty open. Um, it's a nice long length of scarf with a nice fringe on it. And so this would be a great uh, shoulder um, season scarf. It's not too warm but it's going to be nice on those uh, cool evenings. So I hope you enjoyed watching me make this scarf on the Rigid Huddle Loom from start to finish. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to my channel. Thanks and happy weaving!